And welcome everyone. Welcome to all our visitors. We're glad you could be with us today. I'm sure you'll understand when I tell you this has not been the easiest weekend to be preparing a sermon. Uh, with all of the things that are going on, you know, in Iraq, with men dying and both sides of the issue, it's been very sobering, frankly, to watch uh, and to be reminded again and again that war is not a video game. It's not something that you just see played out on a screen somewhere that doesn't amount to something. Some of those explosions that we see, men are dying, and they are dying unnecessarily. They're dying because of a tyrant who has dominated those people for far too long, and I think all of us understand the issues. There's no particular reason why I should try to rehearse them for you here today. But war is naturally on everyone's mind. Inevitably, when something like the current war breaks out, someone will call me and ask if I think this is it. Uh, do I think that we're heading into the last days? Is, uh, are we headed for the Battle of Armageddon? Is uh, this heralding the return of Christ? Uh, you know, I was, some people really thought that the uh, events that started the first Gulf War, that that was going to be the, the onset of Armageddon. And then uh, whenever 9-11 happened, somebody said they thought that was the thing that was going to happen that was going to usher in the return of Christ and so forth. And again, the call came this time again, is, is that what's happening here? Well, you know, I, in, a, in a way, it may seem odd, but at the same time, uh, one of these days, something is going to happen that will be the trigger that starts the war that really will finally end all wars. Up until this time, every time anybody calls me on this, my answer has always been probably not. If I had been alive in 70 AD when Jer Jerusalem was surrounded, if I had been amongst those Christians that gathered up my stuff and headed out for Pella and got over there and heard that Jerusalem had fallen, been destroyed, and laid level with the ground, you'd have said, well, is this it? Is this it? I would have said, yeah, I probably think this is it. And I would have been dead wrong. That was, you know, 1970 or 1730 years ago, approximately. And the end is not yet. I suppose if you take a long view of history, that did, uh, that was the precipitating event that's going to usher in what's going to happen now. But you'd have to have a, a peculiar view of history and prophecy for that to be your point of view. That said, one of these wars to come will be the one that lights the fuse and ends with the return of Christ. One of them will be. I may not be around to tell you when that comes that I think this is it. And so I have a different job. At CEM, our middle name is education. And so what I thought I'd do today is try to educate us all a little bit about the times in question. And that is when the time comes and when there is a war and when Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth. There was a day when Jesus and his disciples were walking around the Temple Mount and they were all ooing and aahing like the country boys they were and pointing at things and uh, and uh, you know how your mother would always tell you when you're a kid, don't point, don't point. But it's, uh, you know, you can't help yourself sometimes and you're looking at marvelous sights. I remember being in New York City looking up at the Empire State Building at that time with my chin hanging down, you know, at, at what I was seeing. But they were country boys and they said, what, what about all this? And Jesus said, the time is going to come when there will not be left here, one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And I don't know what they thought at that moment, but when they got a chance, they asked him what was going to happen. They said, when shall these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And in Matthew 24, verse 4, he said this, Be careful that no man deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This is really odd because all my, I can remember through much of my life encountering people who thought one of the signs of the times of the end was wars and rumors of wars. And you'd think somebody would look at what Jesus said when he said, no, no, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't worry about it. The, t the end is not yet. Okay, fair enough. Then what is the answer to the disciples' question? That still is left open. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, they said, tell us what shall, when shall these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Well, you're all probably very familiar with Matthew 24. So let's take a different approach. Let's go to the very end and look back. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Now, before I launch into Revelation, I'll, and our military is in there preparing the ground ahead of the boys coming out. I'd better do a little preparing of the ground here before we launch into Revelation 19. <coughs> I have to remind you this is a vision. If you try to take a literal interpretation of the book of Revelation, you are going to end up confused and lost, 
And when the time comes, you are almost certainly going to be caught flat-footed. Because Revelation is a vision, it is symbolic, it is not intended to be taken literally. Conventional wisdom among some people is that John saw the future. But the future that he saw included things he had never seen before. And so he didn't know how to describe a helicopter, so he called it a locust. He didn't know how to describe the uh, helmet that a helicopter driver might be wearing, so he called it a golden crown that they had on their head. Uh, and on it goes about the different ways people try to interpret. Candidly, I don't really think John saw a helicopter. I don't really think that John traveled into the future. I think that John saw a vision in which the future was represented by symbols like icons. I'm very grateful for the Mac people who came up with the idea of icons for computer screens because it's, it's, it's very enabling. It wasn't Mac. Was it, it wasn't. Well, whoever it was, I'm grateful to him for doing it. I always got to be careful about my computer analogies here. Uh, but I'm grateful because it gives me such a, a, a tool for explaining now to people what the Bible means when it talks about icons and symbols. Because on your computer screen, you've got a little picture of a printer, and you click on that printer, and it sets off the sequence of events. It's going to print whatever it is you want to print. It's an icon, a visual representation of something, an activity, an event, or even in many cases, a series of things your computer is going to do in order to accomplish what it is you want to get done. Icons and symbols. And so when you get into the book of Revelation, you are just overwhelmed by symbolism and symbols, icons, and you never know what you're going to get when you press one of those buttons. But the question that should occur to us is, why did God do it this way? Why not sit John down, say, get at your pencil, get a piece of paper, I'm going to tell you what's going to come, and this just tell him in very clear and distinct terms, this is going to happen, then that's going to happen, then this is going to happen, this king is going to come up, and just lay out for John what the future was going to be in plain language. Why do it that way? And, of course, all of us who read the Bible know it's done that way from the beginning to the end. All the prophets do it. Daniel's one of the great ex examples of the prophecies that do it. Zechariah does it. Isaiah does it. Ezekiel does it. And so we go on down through the prophets as they all use this incredibly opaque symbolism to represent to us what God is doing. Why? I think the reason is that there are a thousand details about this future that have not yet been determined. The events that the vision represents will happen, but there are a thousand ways they could be brought about and nearly as many ways that they could be fulfilled. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is this, the events will happen, but the details, the way, the circumstances, all are variable because of the fact that God has left human beings free to make choices and decisions and to do things one way or do them another. As I have oftentimes said, one, one of the reasons that God can tell you the future is, A, human behavior is highly predictable, and B, God can make it happen. He can just do it. He can actually pull strings, pull levers, and make things come to pass exactly like he wants them to come to pass. Why doesn't he tell us exactly? I think it is because he leaves us free. God has a plan. He is working a plan. But within that plan, we have the freedom to do all manner of stupid things or wise things, which will change the actual events themselves, either in their sequence, their order, their time, or perhaps in some of their details. The events prophesied in Revelation then will happen, but they will almost certainly happen in ways that will surprise us and at times when we will not expect them. Now, I'll say that again because I think it's important for you to remember this. The events prophesied in Revelation will happen but they will almost certainly happen in ways that will surprise us and at times when we will not expect them. Now, having said that, let's go to the prophecy that is it. Revelation 19, verse 11. John is in vision, getting way down late in the vision, and I imagine getting somewhat exhausted now by what he's been through. He says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. Now, there are little things in here that are worth noticing. One, for example, he's riding a horse, not an ass. You remember when Jesus made his triumphal entry, they called him to Jerusalem? How he sent his disciples out and said, oh, just be a man, you watch for him, you'll have a donkey, or you'll see a colt and a donkey tied by her, untie her, bring her to me, 
and because I'm going to ride that into Jerusalem. He rode up into Jerusalem on a, on an ass and a colt full of an ass. Remember the script, the prophecy, or the scriptures, and the citation of a prophecy. We well, see what all that is about is that when a king is coming normally, he will ride, and you'll find the references repeatedly in uh, in the book of the Kings that the king's mule is not a horse, a mule, but or an ass. Uh, that he will ride an, uh, an animal of this nature for transportation or to enter or to make a peaceful entry. In this day and age, in the, in the day and age in which John saw this, and of course all the way back to Solomon before, horses were not used for agriculture. Horses were war-making instruments, if I may call them instruments. They were tools of war. They were the tanks. They were the, they were that time the mobile, mobile, uh, uh, armor. They could, you get on your horse, move much faster. And of course, when you got where you're going, you could bowl people over with it who were on the ground. It was a powerful instrument of war. So that when it says he's coming on a white horse, white is righteousness, a horse is judgment, a horse is power, we're coming to fight this time. I'm coming to dominate. I'm coming to rule. I'm coming to take control. There is no fooling around about this. Now, do you imagine when you read this that Jesus, when he really appears, will actually be riding on a horse? I don't think so. I think what John saw is, is purely symbolic. What Jesus may be riding on when they see him may be something we would never even recognize or know what it is, or he may not be riding on anything at all, but the point simply is he is coming in a war-making posture. I'd be really surprised if when Jesus shows up in the clouds, he will actually be riding on a horse. Because one would have to say, why? What would be the utility of one? There is no utility except symbolism. Now, I may be utterly wrong, and if I am, I will say, yes, Lord, it's all fine with me if you want to ride a horse. Horses are nice creatures. I'm all for horses. Now, or was John seeing symbolic representations, icons that represented the circumstances of Jesus' return? I think that's what John was saying. Verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now, again, trying to take these things literally leads to absurdity. How do you visualize many crowns? Were they stacked one on top of another? Well, they have to be. You can, you know, Jesus only has one head. You know, you can't move crowns around. I have seen, the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because I've seen some incredibly absurd artistic representations of the return of Christ on a horse with crowns stacked up on his head, multi-tiered, you know, crowns later layered up, and uh, things that people try to present. I, there's, it's not a, uh, there's no particular objection to this as long as you understand that it is iconography, that it is a matter of presenting a visual representation of something, but the thing you're representing is not what you're seeing here. It means something rather beyond that, what, you, what you're looking at here. So John said he saw this. His eyes were like a frame, flame of fire. He had many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. I find that a really interesting thing because the name then that he's talking about here can't be uh, Jesus, Jesus, as the Greek word is. It can't be Yeshua. It can't be Yahweh because we know all these names. He has a name written that nobody knows but he himself. Now, why is this so? Well, I don't know. We'll have to consider on. He was dipped in, clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, here's a name again. His name is the Word of God. Uh, it's interesting in all the discussion about sacred names that has you know, come back and forth across the, the church down through the years, quite a bit was made of the difference between a name and a title. That, well, you know, well, that God, for example, or Elohim is a title of what God is. His proper name is Yahweh. Well, you know, the problem with this is this says his name, not his title. His name is called the Word of God. And in fact, if you just enter the Word of God into your, your, your computer Bible and do a search on it, you're going to find that all through the place where the Word of God comes to a prophet and speaks to him and conveys the message to God. And I have a feeling as I read through the Old Testament so many times when it says the word of God came to me. He didn't say God spoke to me. He says the word of God came to me and said that what we are dealing with there is this one right here whose name is called the word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in linen, white and clean. 
Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. I, you know, I can't imagine what John saw, and it must have boggled his mind to describe this as out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Now, you're, 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 what you're asked to visualize here is a man riding on a white horse with multi-tiered crowns sticking up out, you know, over his head with a sword coming out, a flaming sword, fiery sword coming out of his mouth uh, and riding here and wearing a, a vesture that's all bloody. Now, surely we understand that this is not to be taken literally, that these are all symbolic. They are icons, they are symbolism that are intended to represent what he is doing. The sword coming forth out of his mouth to me simply means that his word is like a sharp two-edged sword, that he gives the command and it is done, and that command involves the use of the sword. Sword in the Bible is a symbol of war. It's a symbol of civil, civil authority and the power to take life. And he is coming, for all intents and purposes, to take life. He is, he is the one who can take life, and he can give it back again, and he is coming with that in his mind. He's brought, he's brought the sword and it's in, that he's going to rule with a rod of iron, and he's going to tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. Again, it has to be symbolic. He's just using language familiar to the people who would first read this, that he is going to tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God, and to anyone who really knows their Bible, they'll remember that oftentimes, in fact, earlier in the book of Revelation, there is this cup of wine that represents the wrath of God. You find it in Ezekiel, you'll find it in Jeremiah, you'll find the prophets talk about the time, take this cup, drink this cup, make them drink this cup. This cup is, is the cup of my wrath, and it's represented by, by wine. Now he says, he's treading out the wine press of the wrath and the fierceness of God. He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now we've got three names already here list, listed for this person the unknown name, which nobody knows, the word of God, and king of kings and lord of lords. Who is this? Who are we re reading about here? Is this, uh, you know, what, what, we got three different names given for the person, one that's not even, that's not known. Well, it goes on to say, I'll, I'll, I'll let you keep your finger there, but in, in Paul writing to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 14, said this, I want to urge you that you keep this commandment without spot, unre unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time he shall show, who is the only and blessed potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only has immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach to, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, I, I don't know what you think here, but it seems to me that, I, and I really don't know of anyone who are reading this doubts, that this is intended to be a representation of the returning Christ, whose name is unknown, whose name is the Word of God, whose name is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Those are his names. Revelation 19 now, verse 17, returning to Revelation. I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves to the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit upon them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and all their armies were gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse, and against his army. What sort of image does that draw to your mind? You know, in modern warfare, modern warfare is really an almost almost antiseptic. Maybe, you know, we watch it on television. We see bombs going off. We don't see bodies flying through the air usually. Uh, we know that you know a few people are killed here. A few people are being killed there. Do you realize that in ancient times, when two armies met in the field, one half of all the people who were in those two armies would be casualties probably in the first thirty minutes. Fifty percent because it's man-to-man -man combat. When you're out there in man-to-man -man combat, half the people out there are going to be casualties probably within the first 30 minutes of battle. And then in the next 30 minutes, half of those remaining are likely to die. I mean, people who went to war in the old days had really not that much chance of coming back home alive. It was the big guys, the strong guys, the powerhouses. These were the guys who survived. And you'd better be ready to fight 
whenever you went out there, because when you got out there, it was you or him in every case. War like that was extremely bloody. If you want to get kind of a little idea of what it's like, you might watch Kenneth Branagh's version of Henry V. It's available on video. It's a Shakespearean play, Henry V, and they, they kind of go through, the Battle of Agincourt is, is in it, and it, it kind of gives you an idea of the kind of bloodshed and the way those wars were fought that might help you to understand what these things are like. Now here what he's telling us essentially is that, that he is going to come and he's going to fight these people, and when the battle is over, the battleground will be strewn with bodies. And in this case, so many bodies that they cannot be dealt with. I think after Agincourt, there were, I don't remember how many people were dead on that particular occasion, but there's a lot of bodies on that battlefield, but they were able to manage them. What we're seeing here, though, is a battlefield when it's all over. They cannot deal with all the bodies, so who gets to deal with it? Birds, vultures, carrion animals that like to eat meat, wolves, coyotes, I don't know what the Middle East versions of all these are. These would be eating these, these kings who came to fight with God in this particular occasion. He says, basically, I'm going to leave the battlefield strewn with their bodies. I'm, I have to ask the question these days, is this, is this, does this resemble the God of your imagination, or is this somewhat different from what you thought God was like? Well, this is going to happen. I mean, this is basically what's presented to us on this occasion. Now, the beast is a figure already shown to us back in Revelation, or earlier in Revelation. The beast was taken... And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him and deceived them that had the mark of the beast, them that worshipped his image, these were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeds out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. I mean, it's a gruesome situation. It's not going to be anything like the, the war that you're seeing take place now in Iraq where the total number of people who will die in this war will be considerably less than the first Gulf, Gulf War by the time it's over, I think, unless something really unusual takes place in, in war, one never knows. But there was something about this, as I was reading through it, that rang a little bell. I have heard the words before, I had read them before, that I read here. Perhaps in my years of teaching Old Testament survey and reading through the Old Testament every year, uh, it would sort of hang in my consciousness. You'll turn back to Ezekiel chapter 39. This imagery that is presented here is drawn directly from Ezekiel. Now, I think it's also important for you to realize this. You may have a little Bible study of your own sometime on this. Is take the book of Revelation and flop it open and start it through it and take a look at the marginal notes you have in your Bible. And as you make your way through those marginal notes, when you see one that points to Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, or, other, or the minor prophets, pause and go back and look it up. I think you will really be shocked when you see how much of the verbiage, the symbolism of Revelation, is drawn from the major and minor prophets of the Old Testament. In some cases, almost verbatim drawn from those old prophets. And I think there's a reason for that. I've discussed that reason elsewhere. But Ezekiel 39, verse 1. Therefore, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you back and leave but the sixth part of you, and one, you know, five-sixths of them are going to be dead. I will cause you to come up from the north parts, and I'm going to bring you down on the mountain of Israel, and I'm going to smite the bow out of your left hand and cause your arrows to fall out of your right hand. You're coming down here to fight. I'm going to leave you weaponless. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your bands and all people that are with you, and I will give you unto the ravenous birds of every sort, to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Then in verse 17, You son of man, thus saith the Lord, speak to every feathered fowl, to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty. You shall drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of, of rams, lambs, goats, bullocks, and all them the fatlings of Bashan. There are going to be animals, too, apparently killed in all this war, and they do get killed in war. You shall eat fat until you're full and drink blood until you're drunk of my sacrifice that I have sacrificed for you. 
Thus shall you be filled at my table with horses and chariots and mighty men and all the men of war, saith the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and the heathen will see my judgment I have executed in my hand that I have laid upon them. I mean, God has been pretty hard on Israel. When you read through the prophets, you really do, you get this overwhelming sense of the betrayal and the failure of Israel and God's hand heavy upon them. And it's awfully easy to forget that the nations around Israel were guilty of the same sins Israel was guilty of and therefore could not be allowed to escape. And they're not. So he says, the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. Now, it's, it's tempting to say that this is the same event. And indeed it may be the same event because I don't know of any other place in prophecy where this particular set of images is drawn forth you know, of a huge army coming down, God himself being involved in killing them off, and then leaving their bodies out there to rot and be eaten by carrion. Uh, this is the only other place in the Bible where we find this. So if this is the same event, then Gog is identified with the beast, because it is the beast in Revelation 19 that is going to suffer, or his armies, that is, are going to suffer this fate. But there's a problem. And turning right now back to Revelation chapter 10. I'll drag you back and forth in this and see if I can get you confused. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. Now we're continuing from where we were in Revelation 19. This is the beast. The beast has been taken and cast into the lake of fire. All of his armies are up here being eaten up by, by birds and carrion. Revelation 20, verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he's got to be turned loose for a little while. This is, of course, what people refer to as the millennium. The Bible doesn't use that word. The Bible speaks of it as the kingdom of God, the time of God's rule, the thousand-year reign of Christ. Uh, the millennium is a, a you know, word that just simply means a thousand years. So here we have an event. Now, I, I, for the life of me, I really should possibly should read up on it someday, have never been able to understand either the amillennialist or the, or the uh, post-millennialist millennialist per, uh, per, uh, perception of this event. The amillennialists don't believe there's going to be a millennium. The post-millennialists believe Christ returns after the millennium, that we have to, you know, we have to get the gospel out to the world, the world comes to a thousand years of peace, and only at the end of a thousand years of peace, Christ comes back. For the life of me, I've never been able to figure that out because it seems to me when you read Revelation, the only reason I know there is a, a, a millennium is Revelation, that all I find here is the return of Christ, putting down the beast, establishing the kingdom of God for a thousand years uh, of, of peace on the earth, mandated by God. So this is that. He says, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, nor received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned a thousand years with Christ. The millennium. Wonderful time. It's fun to speak about the millennium. It's fun to preach about this period of time. It's fun to go back to the prophets and see what a wonderful world it can be. With Satan bound, Christ in charge, where nobody's making war anymore, when they've beaten their swords into plowshares, into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. What a wonderful world it's going to be for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, he said, apart from the dead in Christ, didn't live again until the thousand years were finished. That's the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God in Christ and reign with him a thousand years. There are many, many things I could talk about in this, but these are not the point I'm driving at today. What I think is interesting is what comes next. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations in the four quarters of the earth. Four quarters. That reference basically means every direction. Gog and Magog, to gather them up together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. How can this be at the end of a thousand years of God's reign? I mean, you just uh, the, you hear the sound of hand slapping forehead. You know, how, how does this possibly happen after a thousand years? And it is not at all easy to understand. But here it is. It's on the pages of the book. At the end of that period of time, those who can be deceived will be deceived, and they'll come rolling up to Jerusalem to fight against God. 
And what's odd about it is he calls the whole gang Gog and Magog. Now, there's something curious about this, because as I said before, we have we appear to have Gog and Magog before. Now we have Gog and Magog afterward. He says, they went up on the breadth of the earth. They compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God of heaven and devoured them. This time it's not a sword, it's fire. And this time their bodies don't seem to be left around on the ground. They're devoured. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Now, passing over the uh, many of the uh, uh, unrelated questions at this point, people often ask the question about Ezekiel 38 and 39, where we were just before, as to the timing of the events. They want to know, well, I, you know, I, I can't figure out whether the events of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are before the millennium or after the millennium, because they plainly seem to be after the millennium, but there are other prophecies that seem to place them before. Revelation 19, if the events are comparable, puts it before the millennium. My question is, what if it's both? It's easy to get into a, you know, create a false either or for us. If it has to be one or it has to be the other, my question is, what if it is both before and after? Now, with that thought in mind, let's take a closer look at the events described in Ezekiel. This time I want to go back to Ezekiel 38. Because in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it may well be that we have got two separate destructions of Gog and Magog. And I know that, again, that tends to run counter to what we normally would think, but let's think about it just the same. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, before I go on, just one little sidelight, because one place he's called the Prince of Rosh, uh, people have taken that Rosh maybe mean Russia, and Meshach would be uh, Moscow, and Tobol would not be referred to Tobolsk. In other words, that these are the, this was, these were the ideas that were circulating back when the Soviet, the Russian Soviet Union was a uh, dominant power in the world. And it's one of the fallacies that keeps cropping up sometimes in people's attempts to deal with peoples in the Bible where they did lean very heavily on the pronunciation of people's names, whereby they sound the same in English, but the words are Russian, or they are Hebrew, or they are Greek, and actually don't have any relationship. With, you know, we have, we don't, they may not have even sounded the same in their original pronunciations. We are, they only sound the same to us in English, and it's a, it's a fallacy people fall into, and there really is no way of drawing anything, any other connection other than Sounds like. Sounds like is one of the dominant arguments that you come up with on arguments having to do with prophetic identities in the Bible, and it's not good enough. It's not good enough. You've got to have more than that. Now, the introduction of Gog and Magog into this account is something of a mystery. They are ahistorical. That is to say, they don't exist in history. Now, I know that, I mean, what, what? They don't exist in history? Well, here they are, they're on the page of the Bible. But no, no, they don't exist in history, in the Bible, or biblical history, or any other history. Gog and Magog don't exist. They're not out there. Remember also that this fellow who is called here the prince of Meshach and Tubal, in Daniel, if you recall, he speaks of how when he, the angel, when he finally got to Daniel and was talking to him and giving the answer to his vision and so forth, he said, I, would, I started here the day you started praying, but the prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days. In other words, Daniel tried had to fight his way past somebody called the prince of Persia. Not Daniel had to, but uh, Michael the archangel had to. Had to fight his way past somebody called the prince of Persia to get there. And the battle was so great, he couldn't get by him until Gabriel came and helped him. Or is it the other way around? I forgot. Anyway, that's good enough for, for, for horseshoes, as they say. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we have a great spirit being, an angel of God, who can't get through to Daniel because he's fighting against another being called the Prince of Persia, who I have to assume is just as strong, just as powerful, and the same kind of being he is, but he isn't on God's side. And we know that exists in the Bible. I mean, Daniel drops it on us as an aside. He didn't even set out to tell us about that, but we find that out in reading Daniel's prophecy, and when you, as you read the Bible, it begins to make sense that such does exist. Okay, so Gog, who is the prince of Meshach and Tubal, may not even be a human being at all. 
He may be a spirit. Say this to Gog. Behold, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I'll turn you back. I'll put hooks in your jaw. I'll bring you forth and all your army, your horsemen, all them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now these are the hosts of other nations that are with him, and they are historical. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, Togarma. These are all the people that are gathered together on this occasion with God. It says in verse 8, After many days you shall be visited. In the latter years you shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword as gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have always been laid waste, but has been brought forth out of the nations, and now they dwell safely, all of them. Now, Israel has come back again and again, and will come back again at the very end times, and so it's not always easy when you read a prophecy like this to know precisely what he's talking about, but just understand the, the, the imagery that's involved in here. He says, after a long period of time, Gog, you're going to be visited. That's not dissimilar to the idea that the end of a thousand year period, Satan is released and goes and gets Gog and brings him forward. That's not totally dissimilar. He says, you're going to come into a land that is brought back from the sword, that has been in captivity, and they've been brought back. They are gathered out of many people. They've been brought to the mountains of Israel, which have been always been waste, and they're back home again. I think it seems certain that this is a reference to Israel returned. We won't try to say any more than that about it just yet. I think there are people who see this as Israel that is right now. They see that these, these prophecies about Israel returning to the land at the end of days, being fulfilled in the establishment of the state of Israel, Jews coming back there from Russia, coming back there from the United States, coming back there from Yemen, coming back there from all over the world where they have been sc scattered and settling in the land and creating a new prosperity in a land, of an, of a, of, in a land that had been waste and had been producing virtually nothing for all the years that they had been gone. So I think they, they, they see them as a people who have been gathered back in and are now prospering. That may be, in one sense of this prophecy, true. Verse 9, he says to Gog, You shall ascend and come like a storm. You shall be like a cloud to cover the land, you and all your bands and many people with you. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall also come to pass at the same time shall things come into your mind, and you shall think an evil thought. Now this is kind of interesting, and it has to be thought about in passing. That, that, God, that God had a motive, that is at least the nations that were with him had a motive in why they were coming down here. You shall think an evil thought, and you shall say, I'm going to go up to a land of unwalled villages. They don't have any defenses. It's going to be easy to roll over them. They are at rest. They dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn your hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, upon all the people gathered out of the nations. They have cattle, they have goods, and they dwell in the midst of the land. This doesn't sound like Israel today to me. Israel really is prosperous, but they are not dwelling safely. You know, they are people who have, you know, the imagery of walls and all this, it means no defenses. Well, Israel's got defenses. They have serious defenses, as anybody who contemplates, you know, has contemplated dealing with them knows and understands. They are extremely prosperous. So that this language that we're reading here sounds more like Israel when they came back out of Babylon, but this isn't that, because this was, you know, this has got to be looking way beyond that, as you can see from the overall context of these things. In type, Israel coming back out of Babylon, but there was nothing that happened like Gog and Magog when they came back. Nothing at all. Israel has returned and is prosperous. The motive for Gog's attack seems to be opportunistic. It's a raid for gain. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, all the young lions will say to you, you think you're coming down here to take a spoil? You've gathered their company to take a prey. You're going to come down here and get silver, and you're going to carry off all kinds of stuff back where you came from? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in the day that my people Israel dealt well safely, shall you not know it? You're going to know it, aren't you? And you shall come from your place out of the north parts, and many people with you riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. And so Gog is a king of the north, which is another interesting thing that keeps cropping up when we talk about script and prophecy. I remember one of the earliest things I ever heard about prophecy was back during World War II, and mother and dad were sitting on the porch one night with some relatives talking about the Bible. And I heard them say, at the time of the end, 
The king of the south will push it. The king of the north. The king of the north will come against him. Da, 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 da. I don't remember any of the rest. I just remember the king of the south, king of the north, time of the end. Well, here he is. He's going to be coming down out of the north parts. He says, you shall come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring you against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years I would bring you against them? Hold on, folks. Get your concordance when you go home and look it up and see if you can find a single prophet in the Bible besides John and Revelation and Ezekiel who talk about Gog. Not there. Not there. So when he says this, he must have been speaking about Gog by another name. In another sense, another circumstance, Gog was there in spirit, and he spoke to him, or of him, by his servants, the prophets, in many days, in many years before this. Now, how in the world would you find that? How would you know what that was if you came across it? It would have to be somewhere in the Assyrian invasions, the Babylonian invasions, it should not be the Egyptian invasions because the Egyptian invasions came out of the south. But when you're coming at Israel from either the north, from, from, even from the east, you have to circle around and come down from the north geographically in order to bring your armies and, uh, up. That's the route of invasion into Israel always. If it was from Babylon, if it was from Assyria, which was further north, they always rolled around and came down on Israel from the north. So I think you would have to go back and look for instances of the prophets telling of the end times, of future times, when there would be invading armies coming into Israel from the north, and God now will be identifying that with the Gog that we read of here, and with the battle that we read of in Revelation chapter 19. So we're talking about, as I said, the war to end all wars. The war when Jesus Christ fights, and when he finally puts a stop to all of this nonsense. Now, this raider, as I said, not addressed by names in any of the old prophets, so you've got to look for him under a different name. It shall come to pass at the same time that God comes down there. God says, my fury will come up in my face. God is going to become so angry because of what's going on here. And he said, there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, the creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains will be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead with him with pestilence and blood. I will rain upon him on his bands, and many people with him, and overflowing rain and great hailstones and fire and brimstone. Whoop! Rough stuff. Now, this time, this is interesting. The end of Gog in this prophecy matches the post-millennial destruction of God. That one was also with fire and with brimstone. But the end of Gog in the next chapter matches the description in Revelation 19, where we first began. Gog is destroyed, it would seem, and again, I'm not trying to be dogmatic, I'm just trying to open your eyes to think about what, you're, what, what are in these prophecies. Gog is destroyed twice. Once by the fire and brimstone, which is the description of the way he goes out, in Revelation 20, after the millennium is over, the other one is this incredible slaughter of sword that leaves bodies all over the landscape in northern Israel where people have to go out and bury the bodies. In fact, if you go back and read the, this uh, chapter, in, uh, uh, which I won't take the time to do, in Ezekiel 39, again, you'll find that they were seven years burying, uh, burning the weapons and seven months burying all the bodies, and they still didn't find them all. When people would go, were going to go, he said, when people drive, go through the land, they'll find a human bone, and they'll put a marker by it so that the barriers of bodies will come in and find it. Men were, at, for months, at continual employment, their sole job was to go out and find bodies and bury them when this happened. So it's really quite a mess. Now let's drag our confused minds back to Revelation 19.11, where we first started. We started with the war. Christ appears in the heavens prepared for war. The beast has his minions, perhaps typified by Gog and Ezekiel, they're ready to fight him. The implication is this is an opportunistic battle on the part of, of, of Gog. He's coming to take a prey. 
Now remember, Revelation is a vision, and putting together time sequences on this is, is difficult to say the very least. But I want to just pause for a moment and point out something to you so that, you know, this, uh, again, what I'm saying to you today is theoretical, and I'd suggest you study your own Bible and come to your own conclusions. The destruction of Gog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the reverse of what it is in Revelation in 19 and 20. That is the method of it. And there's nothing at all unusual about God doing a mirror image of something in prophecy. You've all heard the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And so the idea of it, it, it being reversed in history and then turn, being turned around in the future surprises me not at all. It may be confusing to you, but hopefully in time God will help you straighten it all out. It probably will have to. I'm sure I can. Because Revelation is a vision. The time sequence is all but impossible. And I want you now to go back to Revelation 16. Because I do think it's related. Revelation 16. This will be a little more familiar, perhaps. The sixth angel poured out his vial in the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up so the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Revelation divides into seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials. We are way late in things when this sixth angel pours its vial out. There's only one more vial to go in all of the tragedy of the day of the Lord. Now, what's happening here is Jesus Christ returned at the time of the seventh trumpet. So during the time when the seven vials are poured out, they're poured out in the presence of the, uh, of the Lamb and of his angels. So then what happens? He says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Now remember what I was saying before about demonic spirits being involved in the leadership of nations. Okay? I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, this has to be a singular day in the history of the world, wouldn't you say? And it's not really called the Battle of Armageddon in the Bible. People today talk about the Battle of Armageddon. That's not the name in the Bible. The name in the Bible is the Battle of the Great Day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon, or Har Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo, which is up somewhere close to Haifa. The seventh angel poured out his vial in the air then, and there came a great voice out of heaven from the throne saying, It's done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and a great earthquake, which was, you know, we've run across the earthquake here recently. Maybe this fits. Such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake or so great. This is the worst of all. Never been one like this. And the great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her her cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because the plague was exceeding great. This is, by the way, one of the things that God said he was going to do to God. Now, there's an interesting prophecy here that time will really not permit me to develop in any length, but I just want to mention it to you. In Isaiah... Uh, chapter, uh, what, what shall we say? Chapter 6, I think, through uh, 11, and 30 almost including 12, is a unit of prophecy, and it's the one that I often like to go to to use as a, an, an illustration of the duality of prophecy, because it, it begins with the birth of the sons to Isaiah that were symbolic of what was about to happen to Israel, and then it goes on through to, you know, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and that call his name Emmanuel. And he goes on to tell us the wonderful things that Emmanuel is going to do and how the kingdom of God will be established. But just before the establishment of the kingdom of God, something happens. In Isaiah 10 and verse 20, In that day the remnant of Israel that are escaped of the house of Jacob shall stay no more upon him that smote them. They will lean upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And the remnant shall return, even in the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. Okay, we're talking about the return of Israel again. We've mentioned it two or three times before. And always these attacks by these forces seem to come upon a nation returned from captivity. He said, the remnant will return. For though your people be Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall return, and the consumption degreed shall overflow with righteousness. The Lord God will make a consumption determined in the midst of the land. 
O my people that dwell in Zion, he says in verse 24, don't be afraid of the Assyrian. He will smite you with a rod. He will lift up his staff against you by the land of Egypt. You're going to have to fight him. He's going to be a problem to you. But yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease, and my anger in their destruction. The Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian. Now what he says is, What's going to happen to Assyria is they are going to be utterly and completely destroyed. Now, what follows here, I won't take the time to read it to you. It's a terribly boring thing to read. He is talking about, he mentions place names that the Assyrian is going to encounter. One day I took the time and I got my Bible atlas out and I began to look these place names up and mark them on my map. And what I found was the route by which an army would travel from the valley of Megiddo to Jerusalem. That this route that is, actually a route is described, that he's going to come to pass, he's going to come down the road toward Jerusalem from Megiddo. And then he goes on down and says, he finally will come down to a place called Nob. He will shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. And behold, the Lord of hosts shall lop the bow with terror. The high ones of stature shall be cut down. The haughty humbled. He shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron. Lebanon shall fall by the mighty one. This is interesting to me because what it represents is an army that gathers at Megiddo, we know what that is from Revelation, marches its way down from the north to Jerusalem, and we all know about kings of the north and their raids on Jerusalem, comes all the way down to Nob, and then finally gets lopped off like you'd lop a bough off a tree and brought an end to them. The battle of Armageddon is the same pattern as the invasion of Gog and of the beast and the aborted invasion of the Assyrians in Isaiah's day. I have a feeling that when he talks about Gog, and says, all the prophets talked about you before. He is talking about the dominant spirit that led in those northern Mesopotamian tribes over there, including Assyria, including the Medes, the Persians, and that whole gang of people. And that this dominant spirit is that spirit which again and again invaded Israel and finally at the end time will be coming back. They all seem to be types of the same war. Now, I told you all this stuff to tell you this. When the disciples of Jesus came to him and said, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The first thing Jesus said was, don't let anybody kid you. Don't let anybody deceive you on this issue. Many are going to come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. You're going to have all kinds of people tell you, oh, this is it. Christ is coming. This is the war. You know, go flee to the mountains or whatever it is they think you should do. He said, don't be troubled. This has all got to happen. The end is not yet. And that's, I think, where we are today. This war is just one more in a series of wars and rumors of wars that have been going on since Jesus said these words. But there is a war coming, a war which is going to be a much more serious matter, and it will be focused on Jerusalem. That's one of the reasons why at this moment when people say, well, is this it? I say, no, nah, probably not. I really don't think so. The big war that finally ends all wars has a set of hallmarks connected to it. And now you know what some of them are.